Thank you, Colleen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Doug Albertson. I serve this great church, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to First United Methodist Church of Santa Rosa this morning. I hope that uh, if you're visiting this morning or new to our community, a special warm welcome, and that you'll stay after church and join us for our coffee time, which is just out uh, the back doors and to the right, heading down the hallway, where we have good fair trade coffee and do fresh donuts and great people. And uh, we'd love to have you stay and say hello. And if you're a regular part of our church life, we hope you'll stay too. Now, I know there's a lot going on. It's the summer. People are racing around between the picnics and the games and the family things. But if you got an extra 15 or 20 minutes, uh, meet us down in Fellowship Hall and we'll get a chance to say hello. We have a lot to talk about today. And I better get started because there's a special thing in a moment I want to get to, get to. But first, I want to bring to your attention the news of the church. Did you first, did you sign in? Did you get the pew pad started? Please let us know you're here. We'd love to see your signatures. If, if you have, uh, if you are new to our community, uh, put your address in there. We'll send you a present this afternoon. We deliver gifts to our friends and visitors in the morning. So let us know you're here. And, uh, and also, too, um, make a, hopefully you've taken a moment to look at your bulletins. In our bulletins, we print out the activities that are coming up in the next couple weeks. We try to put on the slides the things that are going on in the couple, three, four weeks ahead. And of course, our newsletter, The Rose Leaf, we put out things that are happening in the couple months ahead. But here's the things happening this week. For example, you can make donations to help out the living room. This is a longtime outreach ministry of our church. The living room is here in town, and it's a shelter in our community. And we're, we need to provide toiletries and back-to-school supplies. It mentions that. We'd love to get your help in that. There's boxes that are being uh, set up in the hallway out here that you can use to collect things in. I also want to mention that the United Methodist Women's uh, Fijian Luau is coming up. Did you see that? It's coming up this Saturday. There's no tickets. They're going to take an offering instead. All are welcomed. It's a, it's a feast of fun and food. It's a feast of fun and food that the United Methodist Women's Fijian Language Ministry Group is putting on. That's Saturday at noon. I hope you can come join us. And then we have a very special announcement. Oh, I have to say one more thing. Uh, forget. Th there's an offering this morning. Did you see that? I forgot. almost got it. Native American Ministries is the annual offering that we do uh, all throughout the world. This, the Methodist Church does this offering, the same offering to support uh, seminary students. Did, did you get one in your bulletins? Well, well, we'll take care of that. How about this? Do you got a bulletin? Look on the back. It says Native American Sunday. Start there, and you can always just you know, put an envelope together of your own. And uh, I don't know what about the other envelopes, but we'll take any envelope you give us, okay? And whatever's in it, we'll take. And if you can't participate today, you know we can uh, work that out during the week ahead. So uh, Native American Ministry Sunday is the offering this morning. Now, we have a very special announcement for you, brought to you by the board of the foundation of our church and some of their friends. And I'm going to let them tell you all about it. that we have a new Methodist Episcopal Church here at the corner of 3rd and D Street. It's a wonderful church. Yes, John, it took a while for it to be finished, but California now has a new Christian outpost in the North Bay. Wow. Good morning. Good morning, Brother Charles. Good morning. <laughs> we were just admiring the new sanctuary and thinking that it just, it looks beautiful. You did a wonderful job as leadership of the uh, fundraising campaign. You know, those trustees, they could be a gnarly bunch to deal with. <laughs> well, it was my pleasure. And it's an investment that'll serve us for many, many years. You know, I was thinking just this morning about how we can plan ahead for the future financing needs of the church, including looking after the new sanctuary, but also buying curriculum for helping families out with education scholarships. We really need to plan ahead. You know, someday we may even want to take on a second location here in Santa Rosa. Oh. At our church back in Missouri, we set up a foundation to assist with our long range goals. When someone would pass away, the foundation would be endowed with a cash gift, a piece of property, or even a pair of mules. Well, estate giving is the traditional form of funding a foundation, but it leaves out so many people from participating. We have many younger people in our congregation, and it could be decades before they'd be able to leave such a gift. 
and others don't have as many resources to leave as their neighbors, but would probably still be interested in participating in building something that's active and growing. And besides, who wants to just leave everything for when you're gone? I think I'd want to see a foundation thrive while I was still here to get the satisfaction. Do you think that people would want to give a small amount on a monthly basis? Isn't that an interesting idea? <clears throat> Wouldn't we run it by the congregation just to see what they think? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Brother Charles here is proposing a revolutionary new way to fund a foundation that would help us meet the future financial needs of our church. And it would be contributions on a monthly basis. They would be smaller amounts, a little bit different than our traditional estate planning approach. Uh, kind of a pay-as-you-go plan. You know, enough of us signed up for this kind of a plan. We could raise a very sizable amount of money. Just how much coin are you talking about here, John? <laughs> well, I think we would want to make it a comfortable amount, uh, something easy to do. How about $18.54 a month? You know, $18.54, that commemorates the founding year of our church. Just $18.54 a month. Well, John, my Ebenezer takes care of all of the chickens, and I do the bookkeeping. You mean I have to remember to bring $18.54 to church each and every month? Brother John. Yes, Mr. Doyle. My grandson, Frank, is a banker, and he tells me that a bank can now move money from one person's account, with people's permission, of course, and deposit it in someone else's account with no fuss. He calls it automatic. <laughs> Why, that would be easy for our congregation to participate. And that amount will be manageable for just about everyone. So, if we signed up today, how much would my contribution grow to? Well, let's see. eighteen fifty-four a month for 10 years, invested at 8%. <laughs> Why that would grow to three thousand four hundred dollars? You can get the finest house on McDonald Avenue for that kind of money. And if a young person started and invested for twenty-five years, that would grow to seventeen thousand dollars. Can you imagine what a foundation could do with that kind of money? Wow. What if all fifty of us? signed up today and started giving, what would happen? 50. <laughs> well, that would grow to $880,000. Excuse me, kids. Does past performance indicate future returns? <laughs> there goes that Miss Mary, the business manager again. <laughs> You know, uh, what do you think we could call a program like this? Oh. How about the Miracle of 1854? Oh, great idea. The Miracle, the Miracle of 1854. Who all feels that they would like to get started with this program? Well, I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. Why wouldn't they, Mary? It's the biggest no-brainer in the history of mankind. <laughs> hey, listen, well, we're indeed fortunate to have this foundation in the year 2015. Can you 
you imagine what it would look like if we could start in the back and these folks were around? Hey, Charles, uh, could you give me a form, please? Let us pray. Oh, indeed, dear Lord, we, we call out to you to shine down on us. Fill our hearts with your glory. Bask us in the warmth of your love. Clear us of all the things in the weeks past so that we can be here present with you in this glorious light amongst this bright and brilliant community here at this sacred place. We give you thanks for drawing us together this morning. Amen. Boys and girls, Miss Kathy Bryan is here this morning, and I think she's got a book. There's uh, something coming up. I saw chairs. I saw books. I'm going to give you a microphone, Kathy. Today in Sunday School, you're going to look at the passage from Ephesians, 
It's a letter. Now, do you know if Ephesians is in the Old Testament or the New Testament? It's a letter. Does that give you a hint? Who wrote letters? Did Paul write letters? It's in the New Testament. So I'm going to read to you the first chapter, verses 1 and 2. Paul, this is the beginning of a letter. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That is a blessing. He opens his letter with a blessing. He also opened his letter with his name. Don't you usually say, hi, Stephanie. And then at the bottom of the letter, you say who it's from. But Paul starts it out with his name. Do you ever write letters anymore? Thank you notes. Good for you. Good. <laughs> well, the letter goes on um, to the Ephesians, reminding him that it was Christ gift to us that God adopted each one of us as his child. It doesn't matter if we're male or female, Jew or Gentile, tall or small, old or young, that God adopts each one of us and we become his children. That's when we believe, huh? And we say yes to God. We receive something very special comes into us. It's called the Holy Spirit. But what caught my attention was the blessing. Have you ever taken part in a blessing? What if someone sneezes, what do you say? Bless you, right. And before dinner, do you say a, a grace or a blessing? Right. Sometimes we have a special Sunday where the uh, animals are blessed. Sometimes people invite the pastor into their home to bless each room bless their whole house. Well, when I was a kindergarten Sunday school teacher in a different church, we were studying from the Old Testament about King David, except he wasn't a king yet. Saul wasn't doing so well, and so God decided that Israel needed a new king, and his name was David. He sent a prophet, Samuel, to uh, David's home. The father was Jesse, and to choose among, I think there were 10 brothers, and so uh, Jesse lined up his sons, and Samuel looked at each one of them, and God didn't indicate that they were the ones. And he said, where do you have any more sons? And he said, oh, yes, I have one out in the field. He's tending the sheep. So they brought David in, and God said, he's the one. So Samuel took some oil and anointed David. That was a special blessing, saying, God was saying, I choose you. And uh, eventually, David became king. So I knelt down in front of these children in their little chairs, and I wanted them to see what it was like to be anointed. So I anointed each little head. Well, I had a very special little girl in my class named Barbara, who was deaf. And if I didn't have an interpreter in the class, Barbara often wandered off. She would try to read my lips, and she did a pretty good job. But occasionally, she just decided, I, I see something over there I'd rather go do. Well, that day she had wandered off. And as I was knelt in front of the children, <clears throat> all of a sudden I felt two little hands on top of my head. And I turned around and there was Barbara. And I'll never forget that feeling. She was anointing me. And it was a very warm, very special feeling. And uh, oh, as I said, I'll just never forget it. So I would like to bless each one of you with the blessing that um, Paul gave to the Ephesians. So I think it'd be easier if you stood. Can you stand up? And I'm gonna come down here. And Catherine, because I know you're you're not Catherine. Oh, yeah. What's your name? Kira. Kira. <clears throat> May God bless you with grace and peace. Harrison? No. You are Harrison. Harrison, may God bless you with grace and peace. Slate. Slate, may God bless you with grace and peace. 
Austin, may God bless you with grace and peace. And last but not least, Nick, may God bless you with grace and peace. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your gift of Jesus Christ, the greatest blessing of all. Thank you for our many blessings of family and homes, friends, our church. But may we also learn to be a blessing to others. We pray these things in your name. Amen.
Well, that was fun. <laughs> okay, our scripture reading uh, for today is from two, uh, two chapters in, the, in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 12, and Jesus, the light of the world. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And in John uh, chapter 9, verses 1 through 7, a man born blind receives the sight. As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva. And he spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. He went and washed and came back able to see. Amen. presence might increase, and we might be able to walk even closer with you for having been together today. We pray you will illuminate us through your word that has been read as we reflect on it now together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this is the second week of uh, a new series that we're doing entitled Encounter Christ, and I want to explain again that it is uh, it follows our last series by intention, and they relate to one another. Our last series, we looked at a discipleship process, a discipleship pathway, basically, uh, about a disciple is, is one, an apprentice of Jesus is one, a follower of Jesus is one, who, who makes uh, at least three commitments, to belong, to become, and to be. 
and a, a disciple, an apprentice, a follower of Jesus, in order to live out those commitments, engages in practices, spiritual habits, spiritual disciplines, means of grace to do that. We talked about six of them. But so that those things don't become a legalism, we talked about always having in mind three simple rules as we follow and live out our commitment to do no harm, to do good, and to stay in love with God. But what's the incentive to make these commitments? What drives us? What calls us? What, what moves us to want to be a part of this pathway at all? Well, it is our encounter with Christ. It's our hearing the call of Jesus to follow him. It's, it's growing in our, our closeness to Christ and, and through Christ to God. That, that becomes the incentive for wanting to commit and practice and follow these life rules. And so that's why our series now is just talking about what, what, what's our incentive? How do we deepen our relationship? How do we deepen our encounter with the Christ who calls us to an abundant life? And to enter into this reflection, we are following the, the seven I am sayings in the Gospel of John. When Jesus says, I am the bread of life, for instance, uh, I hear an echo in my ear if you have, of, of the book of Exodus. When uh, God said to uh, Moses, when Moses asked what God's name was, God said, I am who I am. And it may not be an accident that these may be, you know, related echoes. That Jesus, as God reveals God's self to Moses, so Jesus reveals himself to his followers through these I am sayings. On the front of your bulletin, again, you have some of those that are listed there. I am the bread of life. I am the true vine. I am the, I am the resurrection and the life. Uh, those kind of things. Today, we're going to look at I am the light of the world. Next week, Pastor Lindsay will look with you, look with you at, the, at the one that I am the Good Shepherd. And all of these help us to draw closer to Christ. Last week, we did I am the Bread of Life. And we talked about how uh, a step of faith, the first step of faith, is often when we come to realize that God and Christ is providing for our daily needs, our daily bread, and all the needs that we have. When we recognize that God is the source of that provision, that's a step of faith. But, but Jesus uh, said that beyond that, he is the bread of life, that there is something more. There is food that he offers, bread that he offers that does not perish. So something more than daily provisions, something that lasts for eternity. It's kind of like if you have a friend that, uh, that uh, can provide something that you need. Let's say you're not, you can't fix things very well. And you got a friend who's a good fix-it person. And so whenever you need something fixed, you take it over to your friend, and your friend fixes it. And, and you begin a friendship that way because your friend has something that you need, and your friend can provide it, and so you go, and that's how it begins. But after time, you begin just to enjoy the company of your friend. Not because he or she fixes things anymore. It's because they are who they are. And so what is with Jesus the bread of life? Yes, at first it may be he, gives, he, he provides things in our life, but over time we begin to enjoy his company. We just want to be with him in his presence. That's where we deepen. That's where we feast on the bread that does not perish. So today, I am the light of the world. I'd like you to imagine that you've never been to Sonoma County before. And you're going to visit a relative who lives in Oakmont. And you're coming from the south. <clears throat> and on, on your trip here, you're, you come through Sonoma, and you come up Highway 12, and then you find Oakmont, right? And you make a left in there, and you find your relative. And you're going to stay there for a couple of days and visit. But let's imagine that in your trip and your drive to Oakmont from the, from the south through Sonoma, that uh, it's, late, it's, it's 10 o'clock at night. Okay, it's dark. And you've never been in this area before, but you have a, a GPS and you have headlights. <laughs> and so you can see the road before you. And so you get to Sonoma and you start coming up Highway 12 and all you can see is the road. And you got your GPS and you, and you find the road and pretty soon you see Oakmont Drive and you turn left there and you, and you, and you, you greet your relative and you spend the night. And the next morning, your relative wants to take you to, to breakfast. 
And uh, they decide they want to take you to breakfast at, uh, I don't know, some fancy place in Sonoma, whatever that would be. What would that be? I don't know. A good breakfast place. Whatever. There we go. <laughs> and so they say, I want to take you to my favorite breakfast place in Sonoma. And so you get in the car, and you go out of Oakmont, you make a right there, and as you're driving down to Sonoma, you just did this uh, last night, right? You just did it in the dark. But as you're driving down the road this time, everything's illuminated. And your draw, your, your draw, your jaw drops open. And you can't believe the beauty of what you're looking at. The sunlit, you know, the sunlight, you know, the early morning sun that's glistening on the dew on the, on the vines, the, the shape of the hills, the, the, the puffy clouds that are just kind of there, and you just can't believe. You wonder if there's a more beautiful spot on earth, and you just are amazed at what, you just did this trip, though, last night, but it sure looks different <laughs> in the light. Same trip, same kind of a vehicle, but everything has changed. I remember when the light first came on in, in my life. And it was kind of like that. You know, it wasn't that I was, I mean, I could see, it was like, but it was like a car that could see the road ahead. And I could remember what happened to me. I remember that I was, I was at the age in which, you know, you're kind of, I was kind of just cynical about everything. <laughs> I was at the age in which everything that my mother and father said or did irritated me. <laughs> everything. They couldn't do anything right. And the first thing they said in the morning, the last thing they said at night, it just irritated me. It's like, oh, I can just feel it. And I would try to control it, but I just could feel how just irritated I was at everything they said and did. I can remember being in school, and I was, you know, I was a, a kind of child and, and youth that, you know, I did, I did what I was told. So if, if the teacher said, do your homework, or your homework is this, it's due tomorrow, I would do it, because I was supposed to do it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I, did, I never would think of not doing it. <laughs> if I was supposed to do some homework, or I was supposed to do something, or be somewhere, I just did it, because that's what I was supposed to do. I was that kind of kid. But then one day the light turned on, and I remember I was in a, I had a biology class, and all of a sudden I was fascinated by biology. I wanted to learn biology. I, 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 I was just, my, my, I was like, this is fascinating. This is amazing. I remember not being irritated with my parents anymore. Almost overnight. And not because they still didn't do irritable things. <laughs> well, <laughs> But I saw them in a completely different light. All of a sudden, I saw, you know, them as a whole. And yes, they still did these little irritable things, but they weren't so huge anymore. They, they, were, they were minor. Right? Didn't bother me as much because I was seeing, you know, all of them. The, the, my vision changed of them. And therefore, the things they still continued to do, they didn't stop doing them, didn't seem to have as big a, I mean, I felt completely different about them when the light came on. Now, the light for me was what Jesus is talking about in the text this morning. I, I had a uh, uh, an awakening, right, of, of Jesus being the light of my life and of the world. And, and it was literally like night and day. Now, I was the same son with the same parents and the same sister in the same classes, in the same house, and that would be for many more years until I went off to college. But everything looked different, and everything had changed. And in following Christ, I did not need to change anything. Quit my school, quit my parents, quit my life. No, I just needed to see my life as it was in a whole different light. 
Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. When the light shines, there's color, there's texture, there's depth, there's breadth. It's awesome. <laughs> it's amazing. It's humbling. It's inspiring. It's full of everything. And there's such motivation and inspiration. But also the light, at the same time, shines upon things that are not right. <laughs> and are not, right, that are not yet all that could be. But in, in that view, it, there's, there's, there's motivation to want to bring that about as well. To bring that change, to bring that justice, to bring that goodness, to bring that healing. Because of the vision that can be seen when the light of the world does illuminate the world for you and for me. Jesus illuminates so many things in our life. He illuminated my parents for me. He illuminates one another. Have you ever had someone in your life that you could see their potential better than they can see their own? And they're going around kind of, you know, sabotaging their life, but you could see in them what they could be. And you can never get that out of your head. <laughs> and you, every time you interact with them, you're kind of trying to help them to see really who they are and what they can be. And that the thing that they're doing now really isn't them. You, you, you see their heart clearer than they can see it. You see their soul clearer than they can see it. And you keep trying to say, that's not you. Come on. <laughs> you know, live into who you are. That's kind of what it's like when, when the light shines in, in our life. We see God's grace, and we see each other, and we see the world differently. We see the potential in one another. We see the potential in, in the things of, of this world. We see ourselves as created in God's image, ourself also that has room to grow, so we're honest that way as well. We see God's mercy, and God's forgiveness, and God's offering of second chances, and certainly of God's love. And we see that Jesus is not just my light, but he's the light of the world, he says. Not just for one group, but for, for many. We see more clearly the inclusive love of God that is indiscriminate in how that is poured out. We see so many things. And life can be lived more fully. So how do we move from darkness to light and how do we keep walking in that light when we're in it I love the story of the man born blind in John 9 what a story that is it goes on for quite a while and there's other things that get worked out in it but just the first part of it just the healing part that we're looking at today where Jesus brings this man out of darkness uh, into light do you remember what how he healed him did you hear Diane read that what did he do <laughs> yeah you always remember that part. You hear that? He spit. <laughs> but what he spit into? He takes some ground. He spits into it. It makes mud. Does that remind you of anything? Think of Genesis. And think of the way in which God created human beings. God created us out of the dust of the ground. God formed us from the earth. And when I'm hearing this story about Jesus taking this mud and, and making this mud and putting on the eye, I'm thinking of, 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 of creation, of, 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 of what God has done. And, and in some ways, Jesus is recreating this man. He's creating him anew. And he wipes the mud on his eyes. And he tells him to go wash in the pool called Siloam, which means scent. And he goes and he washes and he can see. And I say, yeah, that's exactly the way it is. <laughs> Jesus comes and recreates us and tells us to go wash. You know, He is the one who has been sent to us. He is that pool. 
and we wash in him. And, and the, our baptism, you know, signifies all of this. We go and we, we wash in the, in the love of God, the grace of God, the recreation of God, and we emerge as new people. And again, to follow Jesus as a new person doesn't mean that we go off to some foreign country. Often, it, often most often, 99% of the time, it means we stay right where we are, with the same thing we do every day, with the same people we do every day, the same work we have every day, but we do it with a whole new perspective. Everything has been renewed. All has come into view. And we, we live our lives as disciples, as followers, as apprentices, the same life, just in a whole different way. Once we're awakened to that dawn, Jesus says, follow me and continue to walk in the light that leads to life. Again, I, I, I reckon back to the story of, the, of when Moses led the people out of Egypt, out of their darkness in Egypt. Uh, God led them by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. God illuminated their path before them. And the same way I picture Jesus as that <laughs> pillar of fire before us. When the light, he's the light of the world and he, he sets a pillar and, and he goes before us. And our task, once we're illumined, is to just follow that light. Sometimes I haven't followed that light and it becomes dark again for me. I become irritable <laughs> and angry and impatient, right? And, and self-possessed and all those things. And then, thanks be to God, I'll remember. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Lord, <laughs> open my eyes again. And we stay in that light as we follow that pillar wherever it leads us. And so let's just take a moment and just see where we are before God. And Lord, we pray that if we are walking in some kind of darkness today that you would recreate us. Touch our eyes with that creative mud and wash us in your presence and grace and let our life, let our world come alive again. And Lord, if we've come in here with a full vision, a full view, and we're here praising you and thanking you and enjoying your presence in one another, let us have the focus together. Do this together, Lord, that we might follow where you lead. We thank you that you are the light of the world.
as we gather our thoughts together for this time of prayer, especially call to your attention our Caring Corner each week. We update the information on the card with the folks who have asked to be included in our prayers. We hope that you'll take this card home and use it as a part of your prayer life during the week ahead, as well as complete the bottom and turn it into our ushers or the pastors so that we can include your names in our Caring Corner as well. This past weekend, I was privileged to spend time with the theol I can't even say it, theologian and musician, a man named John Bell, a phenomenal gifted preacher, a hymn writer, and he led us in a number of prayers over the weekend, and I'd like to use some of his words this morning to share with you in our prayer time. Let us pray. O oh, generous God, you gave us our voices, no two the same, no finer instruments with which to praise you, and for these we thank you. Generous God, you gave us words and music, peculiar gifts with which to wound and to wonder, to bore or to bless, to inspire or to disable, and for these we thank you. And in your church, O oh God, you, get, you have gathered us. In your community of common folk and complainers, prophets and puzzled people, you have made a place for us, and for this we thank you. Let what we say and do here, what we ponder and decide here, be real for us and honest to you, and prepare us for the life of the world in which you are also praised. We ask you, O oh God, reshape us. Reshape us until in generosity, in faith, and in expectation that the best is yet to come. Reshape us that we are truly Christ-like. Make us passionate followers of Jesus rather than just passive supporters. And make our churches cells of radical discipleship and signposts to heaven, and then in us and through us, and if need be, despite us, let your kingdom come. We ask these things in your name, O oh God, as we bring forward to you this morning's offering. Amen. <laughs> Indeed, Lord, from our hearts we give you thanks and praise. We rejoice in your presence, and we're grateful most of all for Jesus, 
who illuminates our lives and was with us always. It's in his name that we give thanks and through him that we pray to you the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Indeed, go forth to fulfill your call. You go with God's grace. You go with Christ's love. You go filled with the Holy Spirit. Praise be to God.